Starship Surface. Once again to the Zion Baptist Church Worship Hour. Located here at 165 Lemon Street in Marietta, Georgia. Our pastor is Pastor Eric and Beckham, and we are the historic Zion Baptist Church, which is not bragging, it simply means God has been good to us for a mighty, mighty long time. Here at Zion, we say everybody is somebody and Christ is Lord. And we're happy that so many of you gather with us here at the Lord's Temple, and many are watching online. And we say to you, this is the day that the Lord has made. I don't know about you, but I will rejoice and be glad in it. When I think about just how God has kept us since the last time we met, is there anybody in the house who can say God has been good to you over the last week? He's made a way for you over the last week. He's kept you from hurt, harm, and danger. Even if you went through something, the Lord went through it with you and he kept you. I will bless the Lord at all times. He's worthy. He's worthy of our praise. The young fella over in Decatur named Isaiah Korea says, you should praise God in the middle of your circumstances. I know so many of us want to shout the joy when the trouble's over, but while you're going through, that's a good time to praise the Lord. While you're in the middle of your circumstances, give God some praise right now if you're going through, if you're coming out or headed in, yeah. praise the Lord while you still have a chance. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. For the Lord is worthy. I said he's worthy. He's been too good to us. He's been too kind to us. He has made a way for us. I will bless the Lord. At all times, go with us now into our praise and worship service. Keep praising the Lord. Keep praising the Lord. This is a good day. Today is a good day. The Lord only gives you day by day. So come on and praise the Lord for he is worthy. Worthy. If you're expecting great things, just praise him because he is worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. 
Come on, church, let's bless his name for he is worthy. Thank God for our men's choir and Mother Jackson, amen, leading us in worship on this morning. Our Lord, our God is worthy of the praise. It is another day, another opportunity to be in the land of the living, to magnify our God. And so we give him the praise this morning. We trust God with everything that's going on in this nation, in this world, with everything that's going on in our lives. We believe God answers prayer. We know that God is real in our lives. And so we turn our attention to God and we look to Reverend Judge Montgomery to lead us in prayer this morning. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father God, we come to you in the matchless name of Jesus. Not taking that lightly, Father God. We come to you, Father God, with bowed down heads and humble hearts, Father God. Knowing that you are God, and you are God all by yourself. You are king of kings. You are lord of lords. You are sovereign. There is nobody and nothing above you and nobody like you, Father God. And we thank you for that, Father God. Dear God, we ask that you forgive us of our sins, Father, for we all have sinned and fell short of your glory, Father. Forgive us of things that we've done, said, and thought, Father God, that were not pleasing in your sight, Father God. We ask that you create in us a pure and a righteous heart as only you can do, Father God. Dear God, we thank you this morning, Father God, for your, for your love, for your grace, for your mercy, for your son, Father God, that, that you gave your only begotten son, that we might have the right to the tree of life, Father God. Dear God, we thank you, Father God, for loving us while we were yet in our mess, Father God, while we were yet sinners, you died for us, Father. And we thank you for that, Father. We thank you for another chance. Every day we wake up, we get another chance to do it right, Father God. And we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy, Father God, your unfair, un unmerited favor, Father God. We thank you for that. We don't deserve it, Father God, but you saw fit that we can see another day to give you the praise, Father God. Dear God, I know in this world we may have tribulations, Father God, but we are to be of good cheer for we have victory, Father God, in you, dear God. Dear God, I don't know what, what, what we're going through today in the congregation, Father God, but we ask that you would allow them to bring it to the altar and leave it there, Father God. Because if we are to pray, of something we are not to worry, Father God. But if we're going to worry about it, we shouldn't pray about it. So we bring and take our cares to you this morning, Father God. For you said we cast all of our cares upon you before, because you care for us, Father God. Dear God, we ask that you would make our rough way smooth and our crooked way straight, Father God. We ask that you would bless the bereaved this morning, Father God, that you fill that void of that loved one. Bless the sick and the shut-in, that you would heal them, Father. We ask that you would bless the shepherd of this flock, Father God, that, that he would break the bread of life, that somebody would cause, cause him to fall out with the ways of the world and come on your side and live. Dear God, we ask that you would take control of our mind, our will, and our emotions, Father God, and fill us with the fruit of the Spirit. These blessings we ask in our Son Jesus' name we pray. And let the church sing. Amen.
praise God for this second Sunday at the end of the service today. We do have a baptism taking place and all of you are invited to remain. We want to say welcome, welcome to everybody in person. Welcome to our virtual audience. Thank God for your presence, for joining us for this worship experience. And we're excited about the goodness of God. So I'm going to ask all of our visitors, our guests who are here today, if there's anyone, if you don't mind standing where you are, I'd just like to recognize you and just praise God for your presence. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for being with us on this beautiful day. God is good. God is good. I do want to mention for all of our young people, as uh, we have begun uh, Black History on today, we have a special uh, visitor with us, and it's in the uh, Zion Museum. We welcome all of our young people to go over there. It's split between one session for the teens and one session for our younger uh, people. We have one of the survivors of the, um, the Birmingham bombing. Did I say that correctly? Was that Birmingham? Where the bombing took place. One of the survivors is there sharing her story with our young people. So please, let's take advantage of that tremendous part of our history, a sad occasion, but a part of our history that all of our young people need to know about. Last week, we had an awesome time uh, with our oratorical contest, Black History Oratorical Contest uh, by our young people. Amen. They did an awesome, awesome uh, job, and we have a few of our uh, winning contestants who are going to be sharing uh, their speeches. The theme was Blacks in Arts. Uh, and so their theme, uh, they shared along that, and they'll be sharing the winners of the contestants this next week and the following week. They will be sharing uh, their speeches uh, with our Zion congregation. So please look out for that, and let's make sure we're a part of that. Praise God, we had some commitment cards on, on last week uh, that we passed around uh, to the congregation. We went through a series on stewardship and uh, challenging ourselves to make our commitment in four areas, amen. Dr. Mitchell, does anybody know what those four areas were that you committed to? The first one was what? Amen, our temples, our bodies, and the second area was our, our time, and the third was our talents, and the fourth one was our treasures, amen, amen. And we commit ourselves to God. We belong to him. He is ours. We are him. And uh, praise God for those who are able to make the commitment. If you have not done so, we welcome you to prayerfully uh, make that commitment for this new year or for not even for the new year, but just as an expression to our God for the many blessings he has had in our lives. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in the service, but my understanding is we had over 400 individuals to turn in those commitment cards, and we praise God for uh, the opportunity to serve God together uh, here at Zion Baptist Church. I'm going to allow our announcements to come, and then I'll return. Welcome to Zion Baptist Church. Here are your announcements. Hey, Zion family, get ready for the annual Men's Day celebration on Sunday, March 17th at 10.30 a.m. Our theme is applying your gifts to go and serve. We've got exciting news. Our speaker is Reverend Dr. Greg Odom from New Monumental Baptist Church in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And don't forget to join us, the multitude rehearsals on March 5th, 12th, 14th at 7 p.m. each night. Let's make this Men's Day unforgettable. See you there. The Old Zion Heritage Museum cordially invites you to celebrate the culture with magnificent music March 9th at 6.30 p.m. In concert is the internationally renowned Johnson C. Smith University Choir from Charlotte, North Carolina. These vocal artists were featured in the landmark production of George Gershwin's Porgy and Bess, and they have received rave reviews in the Wall Street Journal and other publications around the world. Do not miss Johnson C. Smith University Choir at the museum, March 9th at 6.30 p.m. I've got a special invitation for all girls and young ladies 8 to 18. Sisters Keepers is going to help you reduce stress, remain calm, and focus on God's blessings in a fun and engaging seminar called Too Blessed to Be Stressed or Pressed. Mark your calendars now for the Saturday, March 9th event, 11 to 12.30 in the Chapel Fellowship Hall. 
please register online on or before March the 6th. Hey, Zion kids and all of your parents and guardians. We're getting ready for Easter, so Zion Kids has something very exciting coming up this month in March. It's Easter, so Easter egg hunts are around the corner, right? Mm, but this year we're going to do something a little bit different. So keep your eyes on the sky. Resurrection Sunday is coming. The Zion Drama Ministry is getting ready, and so should you, for the performance Connected in Love. In it, a young girl poses a very tough question about Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Zion youth, this is tailor-made for your generation, so invite your friends. By the way, adults will love this too. March 31st, Resurrection Sunday, immediately following the worship service. Come get Connected in Love. By the way, some very special guests will be there too. Uh, you are late. I know. I've been stuck in a box for 15 years. Well, welcome back. I Thank guess. you for your next. Well, that concludes our announcements for today. For more details, additional resources, and more announcements, be sure to check out our website at zbcmarietta.org. And while you're there, take a look at our newsletter. Enjoy today. Be blessed. Amen. Amen. This is the Valentine's week. Valentine's is on what day? Uh, Wednesday. Amen. Praise God. Some are wearing beautiful red. First lady is looking beautiful in her Valentine's uh, red. I have my uniform on today, so I didn't have to wear uh, red. But praise God, we had a beautiful time celebrating Valentine's here at Zion on yesterday with our uh, Ministers Wives and Widows Association, which Mother Travis uh, is a part of that. And also we had a renewal of vows with 17 couples uh, sponsored by the uh, Zion Museum. Uh, what a great occasion that was to share in Valentine's. So if you celebrate, amen, go ahead and celebrate Valentine's. Praise God. Uh, ask for prayer for all of our sick and shut in as well as grieving families. Sister Janice Clark uh, went home to be with the Lord. Funeral arrangements are not yet made for that but please look over our sick and shut in list available online and let's keep all of them in special prayer at the end of the service as we said there will be a baptism and then at the very end of the service praise god we are conducting a church survey uh, here at zion asking all of our members uh, to participate in this important survey we're preparing for our strategic planning process and we need uh, your input uh, into the vision of zion baptist church so that qr code is going to be available at the end of the service amen it's showing now not for you to take advantage of now but at the end of the service you can pull out your cell phones after service tablets will be available as well Amen. And you can do that at the end of the service after, after the baptism, if you don't mind sticking around for a few minutes. Amen. Praise God for cell phones. Amen. They're a twofold gadget. There's good and then there's a distraction with the cell phone. So please, uh, Zion, I know that everybody's into the digital age. And so when we read the scriptures, some of you pull it out fine. It's also available on the screen. But please, let's refrain and be cautious, particularly for our young people who get distracted so easily by these electronics. Amen. So that survey is going to be after church. I try, try, try my absolute best to bring my sword to stay away from the cell phone during service. Amen. So please, we're asking everybody to observe likewise as best as possible. Can I get an amen some, from, from some old-fashioned folk? Amen. I got about three amens in here from that. But praise God, we're here to worship him, magnify his name. And I think we can do without that device for a couple of hours to give God the glory and the praise. Amen. And I will add that March is our prayer period. Mid-February through March is our prayer period here at Zion. Our 21-day Daniel fast will be March 1st through the 21st. So let's get ready for that prayer period as we're in the middle of that Easter Lent season. And so we fast with the Daniel fast from certain foods. You can also fast from TV. You can fast from cell phones, hint, hint, et cetera. Amen. 
God is good. We're going to worship him in the giving of our tithes and our offerings as the Lord has blessed each and every one of us in amazing ways. And so it's our privilege to say thank you, God. It's our honor to say, God, that I trust you and I demonstrate my trust by tithing in obedience to your word. Tithing meaning 10% of all that God has blessed us with. We give in proportion as the Lord has done so. Cheerfully and not grudgingly, you can give online through text, you can give through realm, you can give through the church website, you can give by mail. And you, we can praise God together giving in person as well. Hallelujah. Thank you for being so amazing. For every blessing, we give you praise. We, not, we don't take it for granted, and we honor you through this gift. We pray that it might be acceptable and pleasing in your sight to be used to your glory and to your honor. Touch every giver and those unable to give. We thank you that you have showered blessings upon blessings upon blessings in our lives. You've been faithful even when we've been unfaithful. We give you all the praise. Amen. Amen. I do want to mention uh, we will have youth choir for both our Sunbeam and our uh, teen choir immediately after service, after the baptism. Uh, so please, let's make sure our youth are part of that. They will be singing on this fourth Sunday in the month. Also, again, ask for prayer for all of our sick and shut -ins. Sister Sherita Brittenham is still at Piedmont Hospital. She's improving. Also, pray for Brother Louis Culpepper's son, who's having a heart transplant. Continue to lift up Sister Darlene George, who lost her mother in Ohio. Amen.
it is, it is. It is a mighty good day. Hallelujah. Somebody ought to be able to tell by your praise that it's a mighty good day. Hallelujah. How do you know? Because God is worthy to be praised. Oh, bless his name. Every day is a mighty good day. I hope somebody's feeling good on a mighty good day. Somebody say, I feel mighty good. Hallelujah. And he deserves a mighty good praise. It is, it is, it is, it is a mighty good day. Come on and stand on your feet. We're going to jump into the word. Hallelujah. It's all right to feel good in the house of God. Matthew chapter 19 and verse 16. Father, we thank you for the privilege of your word, of the fact that you actually speak to us, not just through the pages of print, but you speak to our hearts through the power of your Holy Spirit. Speak to us as only you can, that we might apply your word to our lives. Help us to honor you. Teach us. We open our hearts to receive what you have to say to us. Bless your word that souls might be saved, that your will might be done. And Jesus is glorified. Amen. Matthew chapter 19, verse 16 through 22. Matthew chapter 19. Now behold, one came and said to Jesus, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? 17, so he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. But if you want to enter into life, Keep the commandments. 
He said to Jesus, which ones? Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness. Honor your father, father and your mother. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these things I have kept from my youth. What do I still lack? What's missing? Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go. Sell what you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven and come, follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful. For he had great possessions. Amen. You may be seated. The young man had came to Jesus and he asked him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? The title for this sermon is The Most Important Question. The Most Important Question. This is a good question that this young man is asking. It's a question that all of us should be asking. What must, must I do to inherit eternal life? We should be asking that question, number one, because this life is not forever. And number two, because there is a God. God is real. The time we have is lent to us by God. And the time that we spend on this earth is paltry in comparison to the time we will have in eternity. Even if you live to be 100 years old, in the spectrum of eternity, 100 is not that long. No matter how much fun or how many frills you may have down here in this life, we ought to have some kind of concern about what happens and where we go when we leave here. It's a good question. All of us hope that one day we'll make it to the other side with the hopes that we can hear the master say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord's joy. We hope that we can enter the pearly gates and walk the streets of gold. The aim and the objective of this life is to make it through pearly gates to the other side so that just as soon as our feet strike Zion, just as soon as we get there, we can lay down our heavy burdens and shout our troubles over. You don't do know that this life we do not have long. One of these old mornings, it won't be very long. You're going to look for me. I'll be gone on home. What must I do to inherit eternal life? This man has enough sense to ask the question while he's still young. What must I do to be pleasing to God? The great question, in fact, the most important question of our lifetime, not what must I do to please other people, not what must I do to be popular, not what, mu not what must I do to be famous. Not what must I do to make more money, but what must I do to meet the master? Not to get my name in lights. Not what must I do to get rich, but the better question, the most important question is what must I do to get right with God? Because this life God has given us is not that long. Our time in this life is not all there is. These temples, these bodies are borrowed from the dust we came and the dust we shall return. The treasures that God has blessed us with will not be ours forever. Kings and kingdoms shall all pass away. But there's something about that name. The question is, what must I do not to gain the approval of man? but to be accepted by God. The prayer we all ought to be asking is, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my spirit and see if there be any wicked way within me. 
and lead me in the way everlasting. Our goal ought not to be to chase gold, but to chase God. Another prayer, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable and pleasing unto thee. This rich young ruler has asked the right question because when he's gone, all his money would be left to somebody else. He put in all this work for his wealth, a lot of time and talent to gain his treasure. He has investments, perhaps in stocks and bonds. You can invest in prudential life and you can invest in met life, but there's another investment he needs to make in eternal life. Because there is a God to whom we must answer, what must I do? The young man comes to the right person. He comes to Jesus the Christ, the Son of God. But you can't just believe anybody and everybody out there. Seems like everybody got something to say about where you're going to go. Folks will tell you what you're supposed to do and how you're supposed to live, how to make it there. When them same folk ain't going to make it themselves. Somebody might tell you that you don't qualify, that you're never going to make it, that your life is too jacked up. But I'm just glad that none of us has the key to heaven and none of us has the key to hell. Nobody can put you in and nobody can put you out. The man asked the right question to the right one. What must I do to receive eternal life? The fact of the matter is the one who answers really counts is that of God's. You and I have a duty and an obligation to seek for ourselves. Find God for yourself. Because the stakes are too high for us to just rush through life without seeking and finding God. Our eternal destination is of utmost importance. So the young man goes to the right source. Jesus gives the young man the basics, the standard traditional answer, the same one. He gives to everybody else, keep the commandments. You know, obey the law. Don't kill, don't steal, don't commit adultery. Honor your father and your mother. You know what you got to do. Go to church at least a few Sundays. Put a few dollars in the plate. Go to Sunday school. Be a decent human being, an upstanding citizen. But that answer just didn't sit for the young fella. He says, yeah, Jesus, but I've done all of that followed all the law and I kept the commandments but he says to Jesus despite all that what am I still lacking he needed more than that from Jesus what must I do not what must everybody else do but I want you to tell me what I must do Jesus I don't want the generic version I want you to tell me specifically me and my particular situation what am I supposed to do in order to inherit eternal life? A personal question to the Lord. The young man was not looking for the standard cliche as Christian cookie cutter explanation. I want you to look me in the eye, Jesus, and tell me what I must do. Don't give me no textbook answer. This is where it starts to get down to the level of a personal relationship with God. You see me, God. You see my circumstances. You see my wealth. You see my life. He says to Jesus, I've done all this, but what am I still missing? Because I'm feeling like there's something lacking in my walk with God. I've been to Sunday school. I put a few dollars in the offering plate. I served as a usher. I sang in the choir. Never been to jail, I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't bother nobody, but there's something telling me that there's more to this than just the routine. More than just following a ritual of laws and routines, something in me that's letting me know that just showing up at church every now and then is not enough. There's something else that I should be doing. You see, this man has now met Jesus. He sees Jesus. He is now meeting with the Lord in person, face to face. And he sees that there is something different about this Jesus. He feels the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit all over this Jesus. This man is healing the sick. He's delivering folks. He's working miracles. He's manhandling demons. He sees lives transformed. The Holy Spirit is moving in ways this young man has never felt before. Jesus has this special divine connection with the Father. For the first time, this young man feels the undeniable presence and power of God. 
The words of the Savior piercing his heart like a burning fire shut up in his bones. His soul is being stirred in ways he's never known. And he sees through Jesus the Christ that there is more to this churchy stuff than just play, play religion to toy around with. And he looks at himself and his own life. He looks at his toddleresque prayer life and he realizes that something is missing. So, Lord, I'm not looking for the basic first grade answer. God, tell me what I must do to inherit eternal life, to really get saved, to get right, and to get to the next level in God. And my brother and my sisters, the reality is that there are many of us who come to church all of our lives but who never get out of kindergarten. Never stop playing church. You've been around for 12 years, still playing. Been around for 37 years, and some of us are still playing. I don't know about you, but there came a time in my life when God shook me and told me, you're going to have to stop playing church, shucking and jiving. I'll be honest, I grew up in church all my life. My mother dragged me and my brothers to church every Sunday and then some. Every time you turn around, we had to go to church and we had to be in prayer meeting. And I'm waking up, sleeping on the floor with folks praying all around me. Mom dragged us to church against our will and I sure enough didn't like it. But Lord have mercy, look at me today. There came a time when something, or was it somebody that hit me and struck the central nervous system of my soul when I realized that something was missing and I realized that I needed the Lord and I needed to know God for myself. Even though I'd been to church that I need, I heard that I needed to stop playing and pretending and get saved and get serious and get right with God. This young man in the text had a realization that God wants more of us than just coming to church, that God calls you and I to a personal relationship with him, to accept him as our Lord and our Savior, and to follow him, that our lives are not our own. My decisions are not my own, that I belong to him. My life and my choices and my future and my plans are in his hands. The young man says to Jesus, I know what the book of the law says, but I've got some personal questions, some personal issues, some problems, and some concerns in my life. And Jesus, I need you to come off the script of the pages, and I need God to speak to my life. Tell me what must I do to inherit eternal life. This man came to Jesus because he could hear God calling him. Been to church. But looking at you, Jesus, I realized that, man, something is missing because I don't have what you have. I don't have this intimacy with God that you have. There's some corners that I've been cutting. There's something that I'm supposed to be doing. There's somebody that I'm supposed to be helping. The young man says, I know what the law says in my head, but I want to hear the Lord say something in my heart. I tell you, saints, there are times when God will speak to us. God has a way of getting a hold of us. God will send a signal to your soul, wake you up at night, and he'll stir in your heart. Is there anybody who knows what I'm talking about? That's what, or that's who you call the Holy Spirit. That's when God speaks directly to me or to you and to only you. God will call you and let you know. This is what you got to do. He lets the young man know that there's more to life than just making money. There's more to life than just partying. There's more to life than just me being happy. There's a God who created you, who has a plan for your life, a destiny and a purpose and a mission that you and I are to fulfill. There's a God who wants to have a relationship with you. The young man realized, I am missing something. The young man acknowledges that there's something missing. What must I do? I have this sense in me that God has something else for me. I can sense that as successful as I am, there's something that I missed. The man saw what he was missing when he saw God at work in this powerful man named Jesus. Jesus, 
I need you to say something into my life. I'm not looking for you to give me the standard answer. I want you to search me. I want you to tell me the truth. I want you to tell me what I'm missing. I want you to tell me what I need to hear for real. Lord, don't sugarcoat it for me. Take the gloves off and give me the truth. Church, we need God to talk to us. Because there is a way which seemeth right to a man, but the end thereof is destruction. There are times when we miss it. There are times when we're caught up in ourselves and caught up in our world and caught up in our ways. And the good thing about this young man that he is open. He asked God an open-ended question. And you see the question this man asked is a personal question. What must I, not what must me and everybody else do, but what must I do? There are some things that are between you and God that don't involve anybody else. You got your situation, you got your own issues, you got your own problems, and sometimes nobody else knows about them. But being a Christian is not merely about following a set of cookie-cutter commandments where everybody got to do the same thing, dress the same way, eat the same way, talk the same way, behave the same way. No, God has given to us the Holy Spirit so that we can have a personal relationship with him. And each of us has to answer to God for what God has given to us, what God has given to me, I got to answer, and for what God has given to you, you got to answer for. A personal relationship. And personal means personal. Personal means the God of our lives has permission to get into our personal business. And our personal space, y'all, are quiet on me here this morning. And this man says to Jesus, what must I do? This is between him and Jesus. Tell me personally, what am I missing? The question this young man brings to Jesus is an open-ended question. This is the most dangerous thing to ask of God. He says, God, tell me the truth, whatever it is. And let me tell you, that's dangerous. You tell God to tell me whatever you want to tell me. Most of the time we give God closed questions and we say we don't tell God whatever you will. Most of the time we tell God, I tell God what I'm going to do and God I want you to bless what I'm about to do. We tell God what we want God to give us. I want God to agree with me. But this young man asked God an open-ended question. And when the young man got his answer from Jesus, he found out how dangerous it was. The fellow left sad with his head hung down, turned around and walked away from God, unable to do as Jesus had told him. What God wanted him to do was more than what the man had bargained for. Jesus told the man, why don't you go ahead and sell everything you got, give it to the poor, and then you can come tag along behind me. It was too much. It was overboard. There's some things in our lives that we just cannot turn over to God that easy. We cannot afford to do this. We cannot let go of all that. We can't live without this. This is not going to work. The fact of the matter is we often have off-limit area in our areas in our lives, areas that we must have for ourselves, areas that we don't, God want, don't want God to touch, areas that we don't want God to mess with. We don't need God to talk to us about it either. Now, young blood doesn't mind giving up some things, but he ain't coming to give everything. Come on, man. You're forcing my hand. Now I got to bounce because that's too much. And you know, sometimes what God wants can be too much. Too much inconvenience. Too much hassle. Too much headache. Too much enjoyment for us to give up. Sometimes what God wants may bring about too much change in my life that I'm not really ready for right now. And the fact of the matter in our lives, we have some red zone areas. Some stay out of my business areas in our lives. Come on, somebody. We don't want God to talk to us about our money. We don't want God to talk to us about what's going on in our mind. We don't want God to talk to us about our marriage and how messed up we are. We don't want God to talk about our marijuana usage. We don't want God to talk about our man or our woman. The problem for young blood is he doesn't mind giving some, but he doesn't want to give us all. 
Jesus tells them to sell everything. Now, that message is for this man. That ain't for me, that's for him. But it is the message of discipleship. Take up your cross, deny yourself, and come follow me. God has a message for you. And it may not be identical to the message for this man. Christianity, I said it is not a cookie cutter commandments. So this does not exactly mean that you must today sell all and give everything you got to the poor. It does not mean that you got to leave your job and then follow Jesus on barefoot with nothing but a backpack. It doesn't mean that you got to make a vow to the Catholic Church and become a priest, a monk, or a nun. To each of us, what God calls us to do is to be his disciple, to follow him, to hear his voice and to do what he says and what my God what God may tell me is unique to me and what God may tell you may be unique to you God told Jennifer I want you to take your tail to Nineveh and preach to your enemies that you can't stand until they get saved and y'all gonna be singing praises to God in the same church God told the Samaritan woman, Jesus told him at the well, told her at the well when she was ready for the living word, she said, I want you to go and get your husbands and bring them back with you. And turned out she had five exes and was living with another boo. The question is, what must I do to inherit eternal life? God will sometimes get all up in our business and he'll tell you whatever he wants to tell you and he'll tell me whatever he wants to tell me. God calls each of us in his own unique way. The details may differ from each of us. It's not going to be the same for me as it is for you and it's not going to be the same for you as it is for me. There is customization in Christ. Philippians 2.12 tells us that you got to work out your own salvation. There's some things that you got to deal with between you and God. What God has for you is for you and what God has for me is for me. And we can fool everybody else, but we can't fool God. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at our hearts. Each of us, God, has a customized calling. It's not based on what you have, but it's based on what's in your heart. And here he tells his rich young ruler to sell everything. That was his heart, his pride and his joy, his identity, his reputation, his comfort, his security. What was most important to him was his money. But his money could not buy him eternal life. He said the greatest commandment is that you love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And God came to Abraham and told Abraham to bring your only son Isaac and I want you to sacrifice him to me. It sure sounded crazy that God told Abraham to sacrifice his only son that he had waited decades for and prayed for. Isaac was Abraham's heart. It was the apple, he was the apple of his eye. Abe, Isaac was the center of his joy. Isaac was his future and his plan. Isaac was his everything. Bring your future. Bring your heart. Bring your plans. Bring the center of your joy. Bring everything that is important to your life. I want you to be ready to give him up, Abraham. I want you to be ready to let him go. Why? Because God wanted to know that even if you lose him, even if you have to let him go, that you're still going to worship me. If there comes a time when you have to live without him, are you able to still trust God? You're going to have to trust God no matter what happens in your life, no matter how bad it gets, even if you have to lose your job, even if you lose your spouse, even if you lose your health, it doesn't matter what it is, you still have to trust God. Come hell, come high water you may even lose your child you may lose your looks you may lose your friends you may lose your reputation but with all of that you're going to have to still trust God 
Whatever happens in your life, that whoever or whatever you may lose, that you still need to trust and depend on God. And Abraham's son came to him, Isaac, and said, Lord, well, I see the sacrifice. I see the wood over here, but where is the sacrifice? And Abraham said, uh, I really don't understand what's going on. I can't see it. I don't know how, but I know that his name is Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. You got to believe that God will make a way somehow, some way. That's not what God was looking for on the money. God was not looking for Abraham's son. God was looking for Abraham's heart. The key is that you got to trust God that the Lord will provide with or without your son. That if you have to let him go, if you have to lose him, even if God does not show up at the 11th hour when you think he should, you still got to trust God every step of the way, all the way to the end. That's a hard lesson to learn. I'm on my way to a close, my brothers and sisters, but even... My brothers and sisters, if you have to let it go, you got to learn to not lean to your own understanding. You cannot lean on yourself. You cannot lean on your money. You cannot lean on your wit or on your strength. But in all your ways, in every area of your life, you've got to trust God. No matter what the test, no matter what comes our way, we're going to make it with Jesus on our side. Things will work out all right. We're going to make it somehow, some way. But it was a sad ending for the man. And Jesus told him, you got to sell everything. He walked away from the Lord because he felt that he had too much to give up for God. For the God who made him, for the God who blessed him, for the God who gave him everything he had to have everything that he did. Now, the good news is that he may have well have lived long enough to hopefully come to his senses and return to come back to Jesus and make it right. The text doesn't tell us, but the man had indicated that something was missing in his life. The man had just left sad knowing that he needed God, but he just wasn't quite ready to make it right with God. When the disciples saw what had happened, they were shocked. Jesus said to them that it's nearly impossible for a rich man to enter into the kingdom. Peter said, well, I don't know about you, but if I had a million dollars, I think I can understand what would have happened with that man. We look at other folks and we think that they got it all. But my brothers and sisters, in reality, we have no idea what's going on in other people's lives. The reality is there's a lot of folk who are hurting. and We have no idea. Here we are and we're looking at these wealthy folk and good looking folk in this world with envy. Here we are wanting to be like them, wishing we had what they had, admiring them. They got the cars and they got the cash and they got the crib and they got the clout. They got the prestige and the popularity and the prosperity and the power and the position and they are the life of the party. They got the life, the looks, and the dress to go with it. And here we are eyeing them with envy. This man had come to Jesus because something was missing in his life despite all the money that he had. The fact of the matter is you never know what people are going through. You never know what's going on inside a man's head or his heart. What you see on the outside is no indication of what's going on the inside. Right here today at Zion, folks, y'all are looking mighty fine today. We drove up in some fine cars, walked in looking fashionable, smelling fresh, made up all nice. But you never know what people are going through on the inside. The rich and the famous go through just like everybody else and sometimes even worse. There are some who can't get up out the house for another day without being medicated, legally or illegally. There are folks who are dealing with addictions and depression and you just never know who it is. The reality is it's true that in some of our lives, just the same as with the rich young ruler, if we're honest, somebody would have to admit that we're missing something. 
we'd have to admit that we don't always have it together. But my brother and sister, there are times when we have to acknowledge that we're struggling and maybe we're hurting. And, that, and brothers and sisters, that as good as we have it, as blessed as we are, some of us are dealing with the void in our lives. Like this rich young ruler, somebody got success but still ain't satisfied. Somebody got the finances and got the family but you still ain't fulfilled because something is missing in our lives. But I got to tell you, brothers and sisters, that God did not create us to live without him. I don't care what else you own to your name. The fact is that God has fixed it so that you and I will not be fulfilled apart from fellowship with the Father. That whatever, whenever you avoid God, there would be a void in your life. And I got to tell you that there are some things that only God can give us. There are some things that only God can satisfy your soul. God is the only one that can make us whole. Can I tell you that there's nobody that can do you like Jesus? You and I ought to learn to trust God no matter what happens in our lives. Can somebody say yes? This is what Paul learned. He had it going on. He was once a highfalutin Pharisee. He had a high paying job and a prominent position. He was privileged and he was powerful. But when he came to Christ, he had to give up everything. He lost his money. And he said, I lost everything for the sake of Christ, but I do count it but dumb. And Paul said while he was languishing in prison to the letter of Philippi, he said, whatever state I'm in, I have learned how to be content. I've learned both how to be a base and I've learned how to abound. Everywhere in all things, whether I'm full or hungry, whether I'm abased or bound or suffer need, Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who suffers me. I learned that I can be fine whether I got it and I learned that I'll be fine if I don't got it. I've learned that I can praise God when I'm up and I can also praise him when I'm down. I've learned that I've got a reason to give God the glory. And here we are, we're jealous of the Joneses, wanting to be like everybody else. But the psalmist said, fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and as wither as the green herb. But trust in the Lord and do good and thou shalt dwell in the land and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. And I got to close by telling you a true story. It was ye many years ago in New Jersey and there was a terrible snowstorm now I remember I was driving up the New Jersey Turnpike and it was snowing so bad and I had my old raggedy car. And while I was driving along, I had to stop at the side of the road and there was this smooth looking SUV that came sailing right by me, floating like it wasn't even snowing, gliding while I was struggling. And I kept on riding, wishing I could drive that SUV myself. But about 20 minutes down the road, I looked up and I saw some sirens and I saw that beautiful white SUV had crashed off in a ditch. And what I'm trying to tell somebody, I wish you would stop worrying about what other folk have. I wish you would stop worrying about what's going on in other folks' lives. I wish you would stop comparing yourself to everybody else and learn how to be happy with your slow self. Can somebody say, I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. No fame or no fortune, no riches untold. Can somebody say, I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. Can somebody say, Jesus is the best thing that ever happened to me. Can somebody give God the praise? If you think you're missing anything, you ain't missing nothing. When you got joy in Jesus, can somebody say, I'm glad 
I said, I'm glad. I was glad when they said unto me, let's go to the house of the Lord. If you just hold on just a little while longer, these heavy burdens, they will soon pass over. Just run your race. Keep the faith and your change will come. Can somebody say yes? Keep on driving. Keep on trusting. Keep on praising God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's worthy. Can somebody say look where? Look where the Lord has brought me from. He brought me from a mighty long ways. I may have never had a million dollars. The road may be rough. The going may be tough. Hills may be hard to climb. But I started out a long time ago. There is no doubt in my mind. I've decided to make Jesus my choice. Give him some praise. Give him some glory. Hallelujah. If you, if you don't mind to turn somebody and tell them somehow, tell somebody somehow, some way, you're going to make it. I hope you're not too afraid to ask that question. Lord, what must I do? What must I do to inherit eternal life? I hope you're not afraid to ask that question. What must I do to get saved, to get right with God right now? And I promise you, you don't know what you're missing. There's no greater joy than the joy that Jesus brings. There's no sweeter peace than the peace that God gives us. I hate to see somebody drop their head and turn and walk away like that rich young man. You think that you're missing something out in this world. You have no idea what you're missing. I wish somebody would taste and see that the Lord is good. Hallelujah. He said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am lowly and gentle in heart, you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy. My burden is light. We got to stop running. We got to stop playing and pretending. God will see us through. Doors of the church are open. My brother, my sister, this day, maybe the Lord has been speaking to you. I'm not talking about from me. I'm not talking about even from the pages of the scripture, but the God in heaven has been talking to you and he's been telling you if you'll open your heart and just say Lord what must I do Peter was complaining he said well I've done what I'm supposed to do what am I going to get God let him know that God is going to do great things you will not be cheated if you trust God with your life Doors of the church open, my brother, my sister. Won't you come if you'd like to be baptized, if you'd like to join Zion Baptist Church, if you'd like to give your heart to Jesus Christ, if you'd like to trust him today, won't you come and meet him today? We'd love to pray with you. Maybe you'd like to come and pray. You'd like for us to pray for you. Won't you come? And we'll meet you right here and pray with you. Believe God for you and believe God with you. Whatever your issues are, nobody else has to know anything. This is between you and God and you and God alone. God loves you and God is waiting 
with longing arms for you to come to him. Hallelujah. Will you give your all to Jesus? Whatever you're dealing with, whatever you're going through, now is a good time to come and give your life to Christ. Whatever area in your life you've been struggling with, whatever you're going through, don't go home the same way you came today. What must I do? to inherit eternal life. What else do I need to do, God, right now to be what you created me to be? If you're here today, don't let another moment go by. Come down. We would love to pray with you. And if you need a church home, let me recommend something. Don't worry about the Joneses. Don't worry about everybody else in here. You take care of yourself. What must I do to be saved? Maybe you were a Christian and maybe you fell away. Maybe you backslid. Don't worry about everybody else. We all go through. Come to the altar today. And we establish that relationship with God. You take one step, the old folks used to say he'll make two. Just step out on faith. Come today. Let us go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity. We thank you, Lord, for those who have come. And yet we know, Lord, in this room and watching online, there are those right now who need to move out and trust you. Trust you with every area of their life. Maybe we've done this and maybe we've done that. But Lord, what must we do? Make us aware of it, Lord. Allow the Holy Spirit to lead God and teach us in the way you would have us to go. Lord, let us not trust our own understanding, but lean on you. And believe in the power that you have over our lives. We're so grateful, Lord, that you sent Jesus the Christ who died for our sins. So that no guilt, no hurt, no circumstance can keep us from your love. We thank you. We praise you. We lift your name up. And Lord, we lift up those in here right now who may have needed to come but somehow could not find the ability. We say increase our faith and touch them right now, Lord. There's still time. Right now, Lord, pour out your spirit in this place we call Zion. Allow each and every one of us to increase our faith. Forgive us of our sins. Renew our right spirit, Lord, so we can serve you in spirit and in truth. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this hour. We praise you for the saving power given to us by what your son Jesus Christ did. We lift up your name. Lord, bless my brother, bless my sister, those who have gathered at this altar. Lord, you know what they stand in the need of. Give them whatever they need so they can praise your name. But Lord, we lift up those who did not come. We know, Lord, there are things in our life that we need to work on and we need you to move on. We can't do it for ourselves. So we come, Lord, with an expectant prayer. We come, Lord, praying in faith, which means we believe you can do what you said you would do. We've tried every way we know how, Lord, and we've been unsuccessful. So now we come to where we should have come all along. And that's back to you. Bless us, Lord, and keep us in your power. It's in Jesus' holy and righteous name we pray. And the people of God said amen, amen, amen.
in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen, amen. Praise God. This way. Church, we praise God for Darius Lipscomb, Kyle's older brother. Father, we thank you and praise you for Kyle. We thank you for Darius, and we pray your blessings over their lives, that you would bless them to be everything you called them to be, young men of valor, young men of integrity, that will love you with all their heart, soul, and mind. In Jesus' name, amen. Darius Lipscomb, we now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Church, we praise God for Kennedy Coleman, a proud grandmother standing up front with the camera. Give God the praise. <laughs> Kennedy Coleman, we now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God for Kyla Bugs. We praise God and we praise you and thank you for each of these candidates and for the power of your Holy Spirit at work in their lives. That they will follow you all the days of their life, that you will keep them, that they can always trust in you. Hallelujah. Kyla Bugs, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. God for Sister Philomena Andre. Father, we thank you for our last candidate and we pray your blessings over her life. We thank you for where you brought her from and where she is right now, that your mighty hand is upon her and we praise you for this day and honor you for all that you're doing and will do in her life. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Philomena Andre, we now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
Let everybody say amen. We have heard the word of God preached today. Won't you stand to your feet? What must I do to inherit eternal life? Turn over every aspect of your life and let God have control of it. After all, he created us. He knows better than we know. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. And the people of God said, Amen, Amen, Amen. Thank you again for joining us. This concludes today's service. I pray that you are greatly blessed by the worship and by the word. We would love for you to join us online or in person every Sunday at 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time. Also, stay connected with us throughout the week with our daily prayer, Bible study, and small groups. Please check on social media or on our website to keep up with all our upcoming events and opportunities to grow. Thanks again for joining us. May God bless you and your family. We'll, we'll see, see you next week.